It's my pleasure to um, introduce our first speaker today. So founder of Grey Matters and Business Advisory, Andy has over 30 years of financial, commercial, CEO and general management roles across a broad range of responsibilities, a vast number of high achievements and multiple endorsements throughout. Andy has also purchased, built up and sold two successful businesses and has an extensive coaching career with over 500 senior executives and leaders worldwide from organisations such as BHP, Zero, Scott's Evergreen, and a number of major infrastructure projects within Sydney and Melbourne. Andy also chairs and has a number of non-executive director and advisory board roles on a number of boards of companies across three states and make, making up over 8,000 hours of business board and executive coaching. So please welcome Andy Rock. Thank you very much, Wendy, and I made some flippant stupid comment last time I got up here. It was great to hear that, those words, and thank you for finally transcribing them from everything I sent you. <laughs> Plus a little bit more you added in. Um, so look, a couple of things. Um, firstly, a thank you for the opportunity, first uh, BVP uh, session, so uh, I get to be the first speaker under the new regime. So. A low bar for everyone else. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Made it a safe space and uh, non threatening for everyone else who wants to get up here in the next 12 months. Um, secondly, it's my 12 month anniversary with the group. I, uh, July last year was my, my first uh, under the, the previous uh, big leader sort of thing, so I've been with it for 12 months. Um, I've met some um, fantastic people along the way. I've, I've engaged with a number of people in the room here, uh, both used their avail myself of their services, um, <coughs> managed to sort of uh, be lucky enough to be invited in to help some people out with some of the work I do, uh, and managed to form some great collaborations uh, with people in the room as well. So, you know, for me, I, I, I'm, I'm just endorsing, and I suppose, firsthand um, and saying it, it has been beneficial for me, for my business, professionally um, and, and, and also personally. Um, and one of those collaborations um, is with, uh, with my good friend Rachel. So Rachel and I met uh, six months ago, wherever, and we've formed a bit of a, a professional bond and we, we, uh, we work along uh, similar lines, uh, non-competitive, but we, have, we come from a similar mindset. And um, I, I think so much of Rachel, one of my key clients, I've referred her to coach um, one of the directors of a business, and, and uh, Rachel's got a lot out of it, and that client has been extraordinarily delighted with that, um, what Rachel's brought to the coaching table. Um, Rachel and I also, um, in terms of the spirit uh, that Rob offered us the opportunity, Rachel and I also thought well, we wanted to try and show and demonstrate VVP doing something different. So as a result, we're actually, with our collaboration today is, um, is we're actually, um, the sessions today follow on from each other. And um, I'm effectively going to build the rocket ship and Rachel's going to take it and fly you to the moon. That's the way we look at it. Or as uh, my wife said today, she said, you're going to... <laughs> well, my wife said to me this morning, she said, so basically you're warming up for the really good speaker. And I went, yeah, okay, thanks, dear. <laughs> and we literally took me out the door. So, <laughs> so you, you, can, you can be the judge at the end of it sort of thing, but, but in all seriousness, um, it is trying to sort of bring a different flavour to it, um, and it is trying to sort of say, you know, here's a different approach. Let's, let's have the first speaker maybe build something, and the second speaker allows you to maybe use what you've heard and then overlay that with some other new concepts and then build some sort of practicality out of it. So that's, that's hopefully what we'll get out of today and we'll, we'll get a bit of a summary and a bit of feedback from you at the end of the day. Um, so look, uh, I've got, I'm actually gonna use the whiteboard. Uh, those of you who are here, um, I don't know, six or seven months ago when Andrew came down and joined me and, as uh, my, my coachee, um, I, I come from a background of doing a lot of leadership training and a lot of leadership coaching. And part of the neuroscience, um, which I'm gonna talk about today, my original presentation was about the Commonwealth Games and I shelved that yesterday. <laughs> I've hastily rewritten another one, so stay with it. There might be a few bumps, but there certainly was yesterday with the Commonwealth Games one. Um, but so, so the neuroscience part of it is, um, helping you understand how your brain works uh, and helping you understand five drivers uh, that are scientifically um, understood, proven, written about, researched uh, and publicised that uh, help you understand what drives your emotions. 
And this is to help you understand about yourself. The first step in emotional intelligence is understanding yourself. Before you can do anything else, you've got to have self-awareness. And so this might, today, help you understand what's driving your emotions. The second thing it may do is it may allow you and help you to understand how you are impacting other people and it may allow you to influence your relationships with other people better. But I caution you with what, I, with what I'm going to share with you today is I want you to use it for good, not evil. Okay, because I'm going to unlock some secrets here about behaviour. I want to make sure that people are using it for the, in the right way. Um, the other part of the presentation today is um, A, by actually not having PowerPoint slides, and this is the seriousness of this, is by not having PowerPoint slides, it allows me to take you on a bit of a journey and you can see it unfolding. And I'm going to get you to share and I'll ask questions throughout it. I have handout here of everything I'm going to talk about. So, the reason I say that is that the other part of neuroscience, and I'll show you why today, is you cannot concentrate on two things at once. You cannot listen to me speak and you cannot read something on the board. And for anyone who's doing presenting, this is a really key point. If you want to get someone's focus and attention, you've got to remove all the distraction because our brains are easily distracted. So you notice I've pulled the whiteboard out, I haven't done anything else. Unfortunately, I took my photo off the screen, you'll be staring at that. But, um, the reality of it is, I want you to be able to focus unencumbered on what I'm going to talk about, not because of what I say is so important, but to allow you to actually take it in. If I'm flicking through slides, you've got a piece of paper in front of you and I'm talking, I can assure you, your concentration will be going between all three and you may not get the full value out of it. So I'm going to give you a handout at the end to allow you to hopefully focus and work with me through this session. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, just as a quick mentee metre poll. Um, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Hands up, who's, who's had some exposure um, to neuroscience and neuroscience brain working and behaviour? Cool, so, so the room sort of, half the room's warmed up. Okay, that's good. Um, and the other, so for the rest of you, this will be, this will be some, um, some, maybe some brand new concepts or maybe just a crystallisation of uh, some things you've read and heard. Now, is that, can that, is that seeable by everyone? Yep. Yeah. Too far the, uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the talk today is going to be two parts. One is just a bit of basics about Neuroscience 101 about how your brain works and then these five, these five elements called the SCARF model. I also want to be really clear, this is not, this SCARF model is not my work, it's not my original piece of um, thinking piece. And in the handout I've got, I've noted the background, the resources and attributed appropriately to where it comes from, which is the Neuro Leadership Institute headed by an Australian called David Rock. Um, he was the one in 2008, 2009, who, um, who originally started gathering all the neuroscientists from all around the world and seeing something in this and um, starting to, to instigate the research. And that's that. I've been a member of the Neuro Leadership Institute for a number of years, and I've got some coaching sort of uh, programs that I've done, um, worked my way through there, and so it's helped me quite a lot. Um, and. The link here between, I suppose, uh, just to finish up before I get into this, the link between being, so my business is heard as advisory boards. Um, the link between advisory boards and what I'm going to talk to you about um, is just the same as the link between you working in your office, managing people. It's helping you understand the dynamics of individuals, what drives their behaviour, what drives their emotions. In, in boards, um, you've got a couple of things you've got to be aware of, how, you, how you're behaving and how that's impacting other people. Um, what other people are saying, why they might be saying it, helping you sort of be most effective by being able to potentially think about what's causing that sort of behaviour. You'll never know 100%, but it may give you an inkling and there may be a couple of triggers that is causing certain people to behave in certain ways. And hopefully that um, comes out in our talk today. Let's get into it. The brain, the human brain. That's the side on picture. That's the side on picture of the human brain, okay. Um, how much does the human brain weigh? How much? Two kilos? Got two. Two over here. Two, two, two. Oh, All right, so much. I'm a right over here. Five. 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 Five down the front here. Five. Any better? Six. One. One. One point two. One point two. One point five. One point five. Who said one point five? Gold star. One point five. The average human brain, Rachel. Rachel, six kilos will be up here afterwards. You get the maximum value out of but, um, mine's, yeah, mine's at the lower end of the 1.5 kilos, I think. <laughs> 1.5 kilos. Okay, of, of our total energy in our body every day, which is 100%, how much does the brain draw as a percentage? 90. 90? 
Fifty-seven point two. Okay. Sixty. It's a lot. Only one point five kilos. Twenty percent. So twenty percent of our total energy in our body is drawn by something that's approximately. We won't get too heavy about that. About two percent of our total weight. So you can see how much the brain is and how instrumental it is. In, and how impacted it would be by a decrease in energy. I'm going to talk to, to that a bit today. So, two parts of the brain that we're really interested in today. First is what we call, and you've probably heard of, the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex in our brain is where we do all the heavy lifting. This is where we do our rational reasoning, um, thinking, planning, prioritising, most of the things that were making you successful in your jobs day to day is done through your prefrontal cortex. A bit of emotional regulate, uh, regulation in there. Your prefrontal cortex, however, only makes up 5% of your overall brain mass. So all of that heavy lifting is all done by a very, very small, massively overworked part of your brain. The other part, this is the newest part, sorry, just, this is the newest part of our brain. So there's other, there's other um, animals on the planet, other species on the planet, that have a prefrontal cortex, but nothing's developed anywhere near what humans have. Uh, and, and we realistically have taken it eons past uh, anything else. But there, there is evidence of other animals having the ability to um, consciously think and make decisions, whereas a lot of animals are just in a reactive mode. The second part um, that we're going to talk about today is called the limbic system. You might have heard of the amygdala, which is the sort of part of the limbic system. The limbic system is the second oldest part of our brain, and this part of the brain is primarily there to sense and detect threat in our environment. It's the bit that keeps us alive. The fundamental reason for our brain is, is to keep us alive is survival. And the limbic system is scanning the environment about four times a second, looking for any sense of threat that's out there, and then that causes it to react in a certain way. So, when it detects a threat, it will then subconsciously, in most cases, create some sort of behaviour that you may be able to latch hold of later on, but it will instinctively activate. So, if you're scared of snakes, for example, and you walk over here and a snake pops out, your prefrontal cortex isn't quick enough to sit there and go, hmm, snake, could be dangerous, could be not, could be this, that and the other. Your limbic system sees it, and before you know it, you jump back two foot. It's taken control of you, only for that short space of time, to save you. And that's the primary what the limbic system does. Now, just to illustrate how our brain works, what happens when we get really, really angry? Actually, no, let's use tiredness, because that's, that's a common one we have happens to us all in the workplace. What happens when we get really, really tired? What, how does our brain function? Here's a couple of things that you notice about yourself. Foggy. Foggy, yeah, foggy. When you say foggy, what do you mean by foggy? Not thinking clearly. Not thinking clearly. Yeah. Distracted. Distracted. Slow to respond. Slow to respond. Yeah. Can't remember things. Sorry. Can't remember things. Yeah. Mistakes. Yeah, hard to make decisions, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is what happens. This is the this is the scientific thing that happens when when the brain when you get really tired, the brain senses a threat to survival. So sleep is your number one survival technique, we need sleep, we can't get by without sleep. So what it does, it starts closing down parts of the brain that it considers not essential for survival. And it does that and it starts drawing the blood flow back in to the threat management system, which is the limbic system. And that's why when you get really tired, you struggle to prioritise, you struggle to make tough decisions, you struggle to see things through clearly stay concentrated and focused on things because the reduced blood flow and, and blood, the blood carries sugar in glucose and oxygen, that's all the energy is. It's impaired here and it's boosted here because there's a sense of threat to survival. Anger, you don't drink enough, you don't eat enough. They, people, they talk about people who don't eat enough or people who are, you know, who are starving to death or, or um, haven't got enough water. They make irrational decisions when they, about things because they can't think properly through those circumstances. And it's all because the brain self-protection mechanism takes the, the newest part of the system and says, this isn't valuable for survival. I'll take the blood flow back to where I need to keep me alive. 
Make sense? Yeah. Cool. So what I'm going to do is share with you five things that actually that prompt and impact on our brain that are, that are behavioural, societal things. Um, and these, I read somewhere um, a little while ago, these five things, a bit like having a, a laptop computer. Um, our brain has got a very, all of our brains worldwide, doesn't matter race, background, creed, colour, our brain has the same operating system, but what we do, how we use that, that our, our laptop computer, where we store files, how we access and all the other things is very different from individual to individual. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about here is five things that, that go across all different manner of race, creed, color and background, but there will be differences in individuals for all of you about how you get impacted by it. So, the first one is status. And this is all in the handout. The first one is status. Whether you like to think it or not, as humans, we are constantly evaluating the environment around us to see where we stand in relation to everyone else. Might sound like vanity, but the reality of it is we have our own spirit level in our head about where we, sit, where we think we see ourselves in relation to everyone else. And when we come in contact with someone who we feel is better than us, a little threat mechanism goes up in here. And when we come across someone who we think we're better than, a little reward sort of happens. Make sense? So, example. Um, I used to, um, have a couple of years, I used to do triathlons um, quite heavily. So I might, so I might get into a plane, I get into, you know, I get into the plane, walk in, I'm sitting in seat 14C. Walk up to seat 14C and I sit there, see someone walking up the aisle towards me and they've got Kona World Championship athlete finisher, you know, T-shirt on sort of thing. So they are, they've been to Kona, they've been to the elite sort of thing. I'm going to sit there and go, don't ask me about triathlon. It's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> this, this person's, you know, super fit and they're looking like they're, and I'm going to feel a bit threatened, okay? In my own mind, in the way I see myself in relation to everyone else, I'm going to feel like I feel a bit less than them because they've obviously achieved or they've done something or they look better. So I'm going to feel a little bit threatened about that. So I may, I may, and that may impact my behaviour. I may choose not to speak to them. I may try and trip them on the way past or <laughs> do anything else like that. Now, next person who walks down the aisle comes in, gets their thing, and they start walking up the, uh, they start walking up the aisle, walking towards me, and they go, um, you know, Hunter Valley 5K fun run finisher. I'm sitting there going, Phew, that's pretty good. That shit. No worries at all. Hey, what's your time? This, that, the other. Hey, come and sit next to me. Let's talk about how good I am. You know, and so you can see I'm feeling a bit better about myself because that's something, again, through my own perception, I feel a bit better about myself because for me, what I was doing, maybe a 5K fun run wasn't so such a big grand thing. And so I'm feeling like I'm, you know, my, my spirit level is feeling slightly more superior. So the thing is about status is we are constantly evaluating ourselves. We have this spirit level. And I said, and we either go, if we, if we beat someone or something happens, we feel a bit worse about ourselves, we go into threat mode, or we go into reward mode. And what I've given you on the handout is both sides. I've, I've, I've talked a bit more detail about what creates reward and what creates threat sort of thing and how to, how to get around both of them. Question? Is that then partly why it could be the beginning and the end of Djokovic? Because now people see he can be beaten. Um, it, this is about the individual in your own mind, so I don't, I can't, I can't forecast about what he might be thinking because we're all going to. Uh, it, it would, it, it will come into it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if he thinks he's better than him as a tennis player, that's going to, that's going to be a reward for him. It's not going to make him instinctively. This is about emotional and brain. May make him play better tennis. It may not. And Djokovic will feel more slightly threatened when he sees that guy because he's been beaten by him. It all rings true. And, and yeah. I was just saying thinking about that example of the golfer when he had the affair, he was the top of the world. The Tiger Woods. Had, yeah, Tiger Woods, the moment he had the affair, he literally plummeted, right? As a result. Well, that was a <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a, that's a murky subject. <laughs> Tough questions already. And Yeah. Um, so 
And I'll give, so I'll give you some examples where people crave status to, to help you understand how people boost status. Um, why do people try and see a famous person, hey, can I get a photo with you? Why do they do that? Yeah, because it, what it does, it shows, hey, look, I'm hanging around with, I'm hanging around with people who are, who are well known and so now What's that happen? It makes me look good. Yeah. Why do people go and get on? Why do people they count their likes on social media and all the other things? What's that doing for them? Boosting their status. We are we are constantly we are constantly doing it, you know. And trust me, when you walk out of here tonight and you walk down the street and you'll go, oh, I don't know, that, that shit Andy's talking about the bullshit. Then one of you, a guy or girl, walk past to someone who looks. Either you feel either looks better, looks smarter, looks richer, this, that, and the other, and you'll feel a little tinge of like, oh, shit. And it's just, it's just our own little spirit level. And often we won't, often we won't act on it. But there'll be times when we do. And when, I can assure you, when you go into meetings, and I've, you know, um, I've done a lot of work in the mining industry, and I won't say all your meetings are like this, but I can assure you in the mining industry, in a lot of meetings, fairly heavily male dominated. Um, fairly full on um, with you know, some of the aggressive conversations. Three things happen in those meetings. People are going to do three things. First one is they're trying to boost their own ego. How do they do that? How do people boost their own ego in a meeting? Put somebody in. Sorry? Intimidate. Yeah, intimidate, even easier than that. Talk. Talk. Status, the more you hear your own voice, boost your own status. You get a lot to. Okay. The second thing they do is they try and drag other people down. Try and have a crack at other people, yeah? Why do they do that? Make them feel better. Make them feel better in an artificial way, yeah? So you go in, you're trying to either boost your own status by bringing other people down or, or, or talking and, and bringing yourself up. Can you see how that, might, that happens in meetings? And, and do it that way. So you know. So again, this spirit level is happening all the time, um, and the uh, the status is is in there and, and it's banging away. Um, and the other thing that we um, you know you, you want to be aware of is that Qantas don't piss around when they call them status credits. Okay. <laughs> Most of you travel, I'm sure. Please don't take this personally, okay? But this is this is a real pet hate of mine. Um, can I borrow your handbag for, for a minute? Yeah. People who walk through the airport with a platinum tag on the outside <coughs> for a luggage thing that is never going under the tr under the plane. Why do people do that? There's no other reason for people doing that. So I'm a platinum. I'm a platinum. I'm a platinum. The marketing people are aware of all this, yeah. So, so this is happening all the time. So what do we do? We we drag people down. We boost our own status. However, I want to give you a couple of things um, and it's in the handout about when you're dealing with other people about um, uh, how to boost them. I want to stay on the positive side, okay? If, you're, if you want to boost someone else's status because you want them to lift up because it's good for you, good for your business and all the other things, okay? You become um, really, really powerful in this way. So how do you do it? How do you boost another person's status for their benefit and maybe for your business's benefit? What's the, what, are the way, what are the ways we do it? Compliment. Compliment, fantastic. Compliment, what does it make you do? How does it make you feel? Good. Good. Yeah. Ask them a question. Get them to open up. Ask them a question. About themselves. Talk about themselves. So people get to, the, the less you speak and the more people speak, again, the spirit level's like that. It's going up in their own head. I'm more important because I'm speaking more. You can apply that okay, not okay theory. Mm -hmm. So you go not okay and then they feel more okay. Yeah, so, so become less threatening to them and do it that way, yeah. Reward? Okay, reward. Yep. So reward money. Money reward? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All status reward. All status reward? Yeah, because you know, people have been going around, you know, in the coaching business, people have been doing, you know, they've just been doing CFO roles all their life and they want to be a CEO and you want to and you can give them a, an out to help them get there, then they can make them feel good. Yep. So again, all of those things are make them feel good. Yeah, one final one, yeah. What about lowering your own status? Lowering your own status, another great thing. You know, I, I, and I, I won't say I consciously did this, but coming on today and sort of being humble or this, that, and the other sort of thing, you're lowering your own status, you're making yourself less threatening, which makes it, you make yourself a little bit more vulnerable, makes them feel a bit more relaxed. You, you don't have to raise their status, but you just, you're making it a bit less than them. Here's the trick, okay, another, you mentioned compliment. 
Genuine and unexpected positive feedback is the greatest thing you can do to, to boost people's status. Okay, genuine, unexpected, positive feedback. When I say genuine, I mean not just, oh, good job, Wendy, and then it can come past tomorrow. Yeah, good job, Wendy. Oh, I see you're doing a good job, Wendy. Oh, it's three o'clock. <laughs> Wendy, good job. <laughs> you can see that it, it, it doesn't work like that, okay? Um, it, it's more about, hey, Richard, the work you did yesterday on that proposal really accelerated what we were able to do with the client. It looks like we're going to win the job as, the, as a result of the work you did. Thank you very much for that. How are you feeling? Bang, million. But it's got to be genuine and it's got to be unexpected because we're like a poker machine. The reason poker machines are addictive, true, 100% true. If poker machines, every fourth pull of the poker machine you've got a reward, poker machines wouldn't be addictive because you know what's coming. The addiction of poker machines is the unexpectedness of it. And our brain is exactly the same. We love unexpected rewards. That's why we keep opening our emails. And that's why we can't stay away from our social media because we're looking for an unexpected reward. If we knew that every third time we opened something good happened, it wouldn't be so addictive. But it's the unexpectedness of it. Now, this is the key to the brain. So when you boost someone's status, okay, when you give them a really big status boost, you flush into their brain a chemical called dopamine, okay? Dopamine is highly addictive for us as humans. So addictive that they actually produce a synthetic drug called cocaine. <laughs> cocaine is synthetic dopamine. I'm 100%, this is, this is, again, dopamine is this, that 20 minute, 30 minute flush that you get, that high that you get that you feel bulletproof, seven foot tall, I can do anything, I'm on top of the world. You become, please take this the right way, if you're starting to do that with your staff and your people and looking at doing that, you become a drug dealer in round status. <laughs> Make sense? So you can dish out the drug, again, unexpected, genuine, sincere, uh, I'm doing it that way, but you have the ability to lift people up. I said, it's done the handout, I've got some of these bits and pieces here. I'll just, I'll keep going, as I said, there's a fair bit written down here. Um, I just get, the status trying to spend a bit more time on it because I'm, I'm obsessed by status. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the second one is called certainty. So our brain is a, is a tool or instrument that is constantly searching for hints, clues, and information to try and map out the future. That's one of the, trying to save ourselves and trying to map out the future. We're obsessed by what's going to happen, what's around the corner, because that's how we survive. And so our brain is looking for a certainty and looking for information that will give us more certainty around that. Big part first. Have people here been in a business where there's a threat or there's a, a redundancy campaign going on. Yeah. yeah? Who's been, just hands up, who's been one? Pete. So how are, you, how are you going to work every day and how are you performing at work? Well, it, it depends whether I am the instigator. Oh, you're the instigator. <laughs> <laughs> Your status is up here. <laughs> or the recipient. So when you're the recipient, how are you, how are you traveling? How are you going? How are you coming to work every day? Well, you're as well. <laughs> But when we say not the, great, but yeah. you're coming to work every day, how are you performing at work? Me mm -hmm. distracted. Correct. Yeah, okay. Who else? Yeah. Who else said that? Yeah, who's been a recipient of redundancy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're second guessing. You're yeah. constantly second guessing. Yeah. Because people have the power. That's right, yeah. And, and, and how are you performing at work? And that must be the somewhat back to say to Scott, because of the, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, you, you're, you know, you're. you're because you're uncertain, yep. you don't know where your status is in the organisation. So, back to status again. It, it, look, they're, they're all interlinked, um, and, and some of the research papers I quote, and I can get hold of them for you, yeah, they are linked. But the certainty one's huge, okay? Whether it's work, whether it's in a bad relationship, whether it's uncertain position with your friends or family or whatever, the certainty one, as all the research says, is the most debilitating of all of them. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've worked with, I said, I've worked with BHP, they went in iron ore, they are going through a massive, one of their, every 12 months they go through a massive restructure and all the other things. And every single time where I'm working out on site with these people up in the Pilbara, 
people are walking around like completely brain dead because you know they don't know what's happening for months on end because VH people so bloody ordinary doing this sort of stuff. And people weren't, weren't functioning, they weren't thinking, all the things because the prefrontal cortex is shut down. The, the threat through lack of certainty is has been completely removed. Oh, sorry, the threat is completely overpowered, anything there, and people aren't thinking. Is that like those that are hanging out there you don't see as well? Yeah. Oh, what hanging out? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it's not, it's, not a, it's not a threat. So again, it, 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 it's relative to the situation. Redundancy in itself is, is an event. The situation you find yourself in will decide whether it may be a great reward for you. Not might be a dopamine flush, but it certainly be a financial flush. Um, but if you, if you are and you do want to be there and you are uncertain about the future and you've got a mortgage up here and you've got mm -hmm. kids at private school mm -hmm. and you've got a brand new car you're paying off, I can assure you the threat of redundancy will be reverberating here and that will be diminished significantly. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll, I'll flip over to the positive. So as, as leaders, if we want to try and reward people and we want to try and give people a, a sense of certainty which takes away the threat which enables them again to be at their best. This is where vision, purpose and vision and planning and getting people and painting a picture of people in the future is so important when they go and work for you. People need it, they crave it, they desire it and they perform so much better when it's there yet you know a lot of people don't maybe share the future plans with them. You say in, in a year's time we want to look like this or we want to go like this and we want to do like that. Even simpler though, if you're in a redundancy situation, this is how BHP didn't handle it very well, all you need to do to say is, I don't know now, but I'll know on the 12th of August. And it gives people the certainty of the date when they'll find out. Because often in those situations, they're turning up every day and they're going, I saw two blokes on the plane on the way in today. I've never seen them before. Today's got to be the day. Word goes through the mining camp and, you know, we're screwed, we're all out of a job today. Because your brain has completely lost its rational thinking ability. I've got a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, obviously, the, the flip side that would be if you've got a situation where there is going to be bad news, it's better to get out there first so people aren't got that lack of certainty, so they know, they get over and done with. That, that, this is what I'm saying now, because sometimes you can't actually you can't solve when you haven't got the answers. But you give people a date when they will know, mm. it downplays the certainty because they actually know when they'll find out. Yeah. And this is one of the techniques, again, when you're managing people, is to make sure if you don't know there's some bad news, give them a date and stick to that date. But don't bullshit to them. Because mm. that's what happens is some people think exactly as you do, and it's fair enough to you go, you know, we'll just tell them it's all going to be all right. And secretly, at my Commonwealth Games meeting on last Monday, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was all fine. I have nothing to do with the Commonwealth Games. Sometimes people get a date. Um, you know, uh, you know, they, they say by the twelfth, by the tenth of August, you'll know. Yep. I think you know what I suggest to people is that I say, well, if I don't hear from you by the fifteenth, is it okay that I can call you for an update? So yeah. you take back the control. Yeah, you, you can. Is that okay? Yeah. Is, that, I mean, is that linked to that one? Oh, no, look, I'm talking about major major events around the future, sort of thing, around the certainty. And, um, if you're taking back control of things, is um, oh, look, that's probably just normal business practice. I don't think, you know, that's just normal operations okay. on creating a, a transaction. Um, look, it's another reason why we're obsessed with watching the weather forecast at night, because the weather forecast gives us a view on the future. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we're craving it. We look forward to it and we like that sort of stuff. So it pops up. These things pop up everywhere and said there's a, there's a lot in all of it and I'll, I'll probably, uh, I'll be going over time. Um, I'm just thinking there, Andy, around the concept of job descriptions and KPIs and things that are found in the service. 100%, yeah. Really? It's important. Certainly around performance, yeah. It's almost analogous and I'm going to be on the different things. The fact that Albo is yet to give the date Yep. Yeah, but again, you've got to put it. Well, who, but who's going to sense the biggest sense of threat out of that? And so, I guess for a lot of people, that's probably you know probably not going to upset them. Like all these things, different different situations are going to have vastly different triggers for people. And a lot of them, like I said, like that one there, wasn't going to trigger half the population. But there'll be people who are blindly obsessed and, and completely out of their head with a lack of certainty about. It. Um, and doing it that way, so it's not it's not like every every situation will trigger the same thing for every individual, and that this is really important to understand. These are five dimensions, and they all affect us differently. So um, the third one out of the five is autonomy. 
So quite simply, as humans, we love to have say and control over the things that impact and affect us. And when that gets taken away from us, we get a really strong sense of threat. Again, in the workplace, what's the greatest sense, what's the greatest sort of uh, management style that, uh, that we talk about here that, that might cause threat through its own lack of autonomy? Micromanagement. Who enjoys being micromanaged? Yeah. Welcome to the club. Oh, you enjoy it. <laughs> most, most people I know don't really enjoy being micromanaged. They will, however, people will, however, give up their autonomy in an emergency situation or when they recognise it for a short period of time only. So if the fire bell goes off and Robert says, I'm the fire warden, follow me, we'll go. Yeah, that seems fair enough. <laughs> I don't mind being micromanaged around this because we know it's an immediate sort of situation and we're prepared to relinquish it. But if Robert says, you will do as I say every minute of every day or within this three hour session, people will be like, so you're micromanaged. <coughs> so micromanagement is the greatest form of removing autonomy. So on the positive side, and again, in the handout, I've given you the negative, but more importantly, stress the positives of the things to do to um, amplify your relationships um, and understand yourself is um, helping people set their own set their own goals, helping people sort of set their own direction, giving people the license to sort of create their own plans is a really great way to get them to buy in because they're building things and because they're building them, they're owning them um, and they're getting a great sense of autonomy. So it's a great reward for them. And again, it comes in. There's sort of a, a little bit of this, this flush of dopamine, but also engaging, uh, helping them remove the distraction and, and free up your potential, your prefrontal cortex. I think it's where, I don't know what it's like now, but Ken, it's been easier. Who more famous for that one day a week you were going to need to watch? Oh, yeah, well, well Atlassian, Atlassian yeah. are the classical one. They'd say one, one day a quarter you can work with whoever you want on whatever you want as long as you show us the result at the end of that. Yeah. Uh, and that was a reward for the people there as an autonomy situation. But those, yeah, the tech companies have been pretty good um, initially because I did a lot of work with Inside Zero, and, and Zero in the immediate stage were brilliant with giving autonomy. Unfortunately, where the autonomy led to was a lack of accountability and lack of performance, and so there's a balance between the two. You can't allow a whole, you know, couple of thousand developers to go off and develop mm -hmm. shit that looks good and feels good and is great fun to do without actually having a hard, a very hard business case. And they've only just sort of realised that in the last couple of years. And that's the big turnaround that's underway in zero at the moment, being led by the, the new CEO. It's just the accountability performance piece that unfortunately is causing a lot of people to leave because they're seeing it, they're losing a lot of autonomy. And that's why a lot of people have left zero in the last. There's a lot of redundancies, but a lot of people have left zero in the last number of, um, probably last year or two, because they've had to really tighten that up and people are feeling like I'm losing my autonomy. So the threats come up and they've taken some action to try and get themselves away from that. So that's, uh, so, so the fourth one is relatedness. Um, so relatedness is, uh, is really interesting. So we like, to be, and we like to hang around the people we want to hang around with. Okay, so we like to be around the people we like to be around with. And when we can't, we're not able to, um, or we don't feel like we're in the inner circle, um, we get a very strong sense of threat. Um, the best example I've got of this, one, <coughs> I, I like to share, I think is um, my daughter uh, at the year. Year nine, year, year nine, yeah, she went to boarding school in Sydney. We were living in country New South Wales. She went to boarding school. Um, and in boarding school, you've got 45 girls from you know, all rural areas all living together sort of thing. And the, the, the in and the out group in boarding school in year nine and year 10 with mobile phones involved changed about every 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> girls are incredibly cruel cool. <laughs> uh, and they get girl, girls I'm very attuned to this we are all attuned to it I said subconsciously but we all know how to hurt people okay we all know how to make people feel bad you know if I, 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 I want to address the room and I want to make everyone feel special you know I just block people out and you know and all, of, all of a sudden you know I've marginalised them and they don't feel part of the inner circle and we know how to do it um, it's just that we subconsciously I'm sharing with you now, or consciously I'm sharing with you why we do it. Um, so companies and businesses, again, who um, understand this know that 
one of the great signifiers in our modern business working environment is the sharing of information indicates whether you're part of the in-group or the out-group. Sharing of information. So, another example from uh, the corporate world, um, you know, BHP, they did do this one very well, um, is when they were actually um, selling some mines, which involved a whole lot of employees who were currently employed there. There's two ways they could have gone about it. The first way they could have, which they were obliged to do, ASX announcement, and then we go and see all the people, and we go and tell all the staff. What they actually did, which was very, very clever for once, is they actually told all of the people an hour and a half before it hit the press, thereby signifying to all the people that you're important because you are getting the information first. You are part of the inner circle. Hence, people's sense of relatedness to BHP lifted. If they'd done it the other way around, all the workers on the mines, be, they rip, all the phones start buzzing, and their wives and girlfriends start ringing, and boyfriends start going, hey, what did I just say on the ABC? You know, XXX mine is, is being sold. What the fuck? And, and everyone's rioting. So it, it, be conscious and be aware that when you're sharing information, you're sending signals to people about the sense of relatedness of where you, where you see them in the organisation. Intentionally, unintentionally, it may work for you. This one is this one's linked to trust, and there's also a darker side to this. Um, I was talking about it this morning. The darker side to this, um, when people don't feel like they're related to this society in general, um, is people feel um, alone and depressed and unconnected when people feel very, very threatened and they're not, they don't feel like they're connected to people, they don't feel a sense of relatedness to other people. And there's a massive, massive body of evidence, you know, with too many pages to find that uh, that's leading to all sorts of, not just mental health breakdowns, but physical health and all the other things. And there's an article, I think, Finn Review this morning um, had a, a quite a big article around this. Yeah. Is that being pushed by the uh, work from home and Zoom and stuff? Look, there is some sense of that. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's a very, very valid point. So, um, we, again, we know, I keep saying we as if I'm doing the research, Michael, you're probably doing more of the research and you're more involved than me from an academic point of view, but what is, what is coming out now is that there's much slower to build teams because you don't get the same connection through video. And again, if people aren't on video and all the other things, you're not getting that sense of relatedness. You know, you go to, in some businesses and government organisations my wife worked for, you didn't have to have your video screen on. You go to a meeting, you have your video screen on. What's that do for your sense of relatedness? You go, well, hang on, I've got mine on, you haven't. All of a sudden, we're well, you know, we same group here. Or, or people dialing in on the phone and some are on video and stuff like that. So again, it's, it's hitting on, Partly, again, Richard, term, maybe hitting a bit on status, I'm too important, you know, I think I'm more important, I don't have to have my video on, but it's certainly hitting in relatedness is people aren't creating those bonds within teams and within organisations because they're working as separate nodes all around the place just connected by a video screen. So, yeah, good observation. How am I going for time, Lynn? Drinks time, yeah? Um, okay, relatedness. Okay. What about strategic linking through you know, government are very good at within business deliberately leaking something out? I've got to use it out. Oh, does it fit into this? Oh, I think that's more of a PR campaign than a, 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 a you know, yeah. I, personally, I think leaking stuff out in the media and all the other things has probably got less to do with. This, it may be trying to create some certainty or, or get ahead of it and, and reduce the sense of threat people may feel by softening people up. You know, again, the budget, there's always leaks and pre-briefings from the budget. So I guess we're creating a sense of certainty of what's going to come out in the budget, so it's not a big wang bam surprise. That's PR is PR is certainly managing some of those expectations with a, a conscious or potentially subconscious view of some of these things. It does probably fit into the last one though. So fairness, so as humans. Uh, we have an overriding sense of being treated fairly and seeing other people being treated fairly. That's the, uh, that's the 45 minute warning. Um, so, um, it, it, and, it, and it goes through again, through all of us. And it's so easy to incite in people. And, you know, the, the classic one, uh, I suppose you see out in the workforce is you see um, 
trade union leaders are brilliant at, at doing this and, and calling, rallying people, sort of thing about lack of fairness. Hey, look what the CEO is getting paid. You guys are underpaid. It's not fair. It's not fair. And you see, you know, often those things are all about fairness, 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 and fairness. And it's just, you know, people's perception of fairness and, and not being treated fairly will, will incite and will um, uh, encourage an immense amount of energy because people, it's a really strong trigger point for people. So, you know, in your own organisations, being seen to treat people fairly and being, and, 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 and as much as doing, treating people fairly, it's being seen to treat people fairly. Um, and, and again, in a lot of organisations, you might have two different people that have the same sort of safety incident. And, and one's a contractor and one's an employee. And you, you know who's going to get treated less, less fairly will be the contractor. And so it sends a message, you know, that the contractors aren't getting treated fairly, but the employee, the full-time employee is. And it happens a lot in our organisations where there's, you know, we have the ability to maybe send a message out and we'll pick a softer target. It's not really tough and it's not really fair. And we know that that's happening. And, and you'll get really bitter and twisted and, and you know you've got off and you've been treated more fairly than you should have potentially. Kids know a lot about, I mean, but kids at a young age always talk about, oh, that's not fair, you didn't do it. You know, that's one of the things that they start with. They don't really think about the status or all of those things, but fairness is one of the things that they, you know, particularly at a young age, they sort of, they, 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 you know, they you know what, instinctively, it's again, yeah. another spirit level. You know, you, you remember, you know, back, back, you know, you and I sort of had a similar sort of vintage. You know, swapping marbles, for example. You know, you had a spider and someone else said, oh, that's not fair. And you know, it's, you know the value of shit immediately. And we said, we've got the same spirit level going on around these sorts of things. And so, you know, be aware that we're all programmed, we're all programmed the, the same way as you'll find in all five of these things that there is different triggers for all of us um, and there is different things that will impact us and, and won't impact us and to different levels um, in terms of how our brain operates. Um, so it's called... Funnily enough, or conveniently enough, but again, it's not mine. It's called the SCARF model. And if you look it up, there's an online survey you can do. It's at, at, at um, Neuro Leadership Institute. Uh, might be uh, a link into a South African branch of it. And you actually do an online survey, a free online survey. It, it gives you answers and questions. It gives you a bit of feedback if your emotional intelligence is uh, needing some comfort levels about which one or what ranking it is for you. Um, about you know asking you some questions about what might trigger you the most, but I guess the point of the, the, the chat today, I want to leave you with a couple of things. Is this came to me twelve years ago, sort of thing? I'm, you know, I reckon I've got a moderate level of emotional intelligence. Feel free to argue with me in the break. Um, but um, I keep going back. If you can understand yourself, if you can understand what's triggering you, and and you find yourself in a meeting and you're getting incredibly angry or frustration, a whole range of negative emotions sort of thing, go back and sort of sit there and say, is my status, you know, when I'm doing a lot of coaching, is my status getting to me? Am I feeling, am I feeling a bit below here? So all of a sudden I'm not thinking rationally, I want to get even with the person, I want to, I want to crush them, I want to destroy them, I want to talk over them, this, that and the other. And, and once you can understand that, then you can do something about it. But in emotional intelligence and, 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 and with the whole field of cognitive behaviour um, theory, if you don't know what's causing the emotion, you don't know what's triggering it, you can't go back and do anything about it. It's very, very difficult. Because you've got to change the script and you've got to know what the script is first that you want to change. And so that's, that's, that's I suppose, what I'm, again, in terms of coaching and working with boards and working with all the different individuals, it's sort of trying to say, well, you know, what are you saying to yourself here? If people can be honest and say, oh, you know, those people think they're better than me, or those people keep talking more than me, or they, I feel worse than those people, etc., etc. Good. It doesn't change the situation, but it, it will change your interpretation, your view of the situation, and that's all you're looking at doing. You can't change situations, you can only change your perception of the situation, and this, your perception of the situation will be driving those couple of things. The second thing is, as I said, if you can see and understand and know these things, it allows you maybe to influence other people's behaviour. <laughs> by not being so, so threatening to them. And maybe even on the other side, even providing them with a reward. And, and that can be a really powerful tool in your toolkit. The third thing is, and I'll leave you with this, so that we're either moving, we're moving towards reward, as I said, with these things, or we're moving away from threat. 
And our brain, like I said, is, is reacting to both of those. But the real kicker is, as I said at the beginning, our brain is four times more attuned to sensing and reacting to the threat more powerful than the reward. The negative, pardon me, in this situation is far more debilitating than the reward aspect of the brain. So just be aware, you, you don't have to be overtly sensitive, it just, that's just the natural way our brain works. That's all I've got. <laughs> I've got a question at last, Dr. Murphy. So you, what you're really saying is that the stick's better than the carrot when you're trying to get people to do things. Um, because the threat of the stick is going to be more powerful than the carrot the reward. Okay, so, so the stick and carrot um, system of, of human behaviour um, has been worked out by humans long ago. We know stick and carrot now. We know that we're, we're, we're being played. So, yeah, so the stick and carrot doesn't, but... Um, if you feel that you're being threatening or you, or you feel like, um, let's just go back to status, you know, up here, if, there's a, if, if two people are talking and one's talking 51% of the time and the other's talking 49% of the time, even people's own subconscious sense knows they're talking more, they get a status boost. You don't have to take a knock on that, that's just you being smart by shutting up. And so all you do by not changing anything more than just being quiet, slightly more than, than they are, is giving them a boost without downgrading your own status at all. And it's being able to use those sorts of little tools by listening more, talking less, it gives people a, a, a little bit of a boost that allows them to be better, but also allows you to connect with them better because you're not a threat. If I go out to lunch with you or go have a coffee and I speak for 85% of the time, you're going to walk away and go, didn't listen at all. Another big one, I forgot to mention, the other great thing you want to do, if you want to try and build a really great reform boost people's status, remember their name. Yeah. It's a really simple thing. But you know what you know it's like when you get, you know, um, Susan, when you get someone's name? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know how you feel when you get some, when someone gets your name wrong? Right, Ella? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to, I remember, but but I'm, I'm being serious though, but it's one of those critical things, and you hear about these really powerful leaders, and they're able to walk into a room and remember people's names, and what happens? You feel bloody awesome, don't you? God, I haven't seen them for three months, I remember my name. What's that do? It boosts your status. I feel important, I feel recognised, I am someone. I walk in the room and go, yeah, g'day mate, g'day mate, g'day mate, g'day Steve, and you're going, oh shit, what do I feel like? Room is Steve, I'm mate, 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 mate. So it's those little triggers that subconsciously are happening to us all the time, but the name is an absolute, trying to get people's names right and remembering it and being able to recall it is so powerful in terms of influencing and creating a little bit of a status boost for people which will stand you in good stead. Christian. Oh, sorry, I missed one up the back. Oh, it was just um, a 17 year old boy. Could you tell me the size of the prefrontal cortex? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, so I've got a 21 year old son. I've got three of them. Yeah, so. yeah, have you? Okay. Yeah, so the, the size, that's the size of the prefrontal cortex for, for um, a 17 year old boy is about that same size, okay? Regrettably, there's no blood flow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to tell you where it's going. <laughs> But this is this is an M-rated program. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, uh, Barack Obama um, remembered people's names, and he remembered in the White House, he remembered the Clinton's names, yep. he remembered all the he remembered all the people that you know that, that he came into contact with. He remembered the security guards, he remembered where their yep. kids went to school, and everything. He, you know, people thought he was the most amazing person because he remembered everybody's name. And that's what everybody remembers. People don't remember much about his presidency, um, you know, in the White House, uh, you know, but they remember they, they remembered all his, they remembered all the names. So, and because again, he's made that person, that dopamine flush, he's made them feel a little bit taller, a little bit bigger, a little bit more important. Mm -hmm. And again, through doing nothing more than having the the conscious effort or the courtesy to remember someone's name, and and that's all you do, but. Those people remember him forever, 
Mm -hmm. the, the next person who said, I, you know, the janitor or whatever they call them. Yeah. Question, question, yes. So with the staff method though, yep. is it not all really dependent on a person's emotional intelligence? Because if you're in a management position and you think that you're relating to someone but actually you're completely off the mark, you're going to think that you're trying to decrease the threat but you actually increase it because you're proving that you don't. So yeah. is that, like how do you kind of combat that or like even within your own teams as well when you have people who are working together and um, obviously all different personalities and stuff like that so everyone's going to need something different someone might think that they're doing something really positive but for another person they may not see it that way so yep so you hit on a really good thing so emotional intelligence really really quickly and i'll be emotional intelligence self-awareness mm -hmm. first got to have self-awareness self-management so with that you can't manage yourself if you're not aware of what you're doing and what's going on yeah and then it's um uh how can we do it in letters it, it's um it, it, well it's relationship management but it's understand it, it, it's actually it, it's awareness of of other people social, social, social awareness social. Social. social awareness and then relationship management now you've got to start there mm -hmm. if you can't manage yourself you can't manage other people um and, and doing it that way so emotional intelligence can be taught it's about 25 to 30 percent um, you, you know, you get a hereditary advantage sort of thing, but it can be taught. Um, but that's what I'm doing with the, this sort of stuff, is trying to give you, not you personally, but everyone here, um, take it from the subconscious to the conscious so you can actually start doing this bit. Because if you don't know what's triggering you in some of these areas, and I can assure if you go away from here and you wonder why you're maybe experiencing some negative emotions, which will come from this threat, is you'll go back and you maybe you can actually be able to put it down to some of those things next time you'll know okay now i know why i'm being threatened now i can choose my behavior i'm in response mode as opposed to react mode so you, in terms of your, your your manager who has a low emotional intelligence you can't fix other people it wasn't my manager <laughs> okay that's all right <laughs> i was just saying like no, 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 I, no i meant the other manager i, I meant the other manager who's not here <laughs> Thank you very much.